city. Um, and so he, he was able to appeal to both people in the north, people in the south, uh, and he was broadly popular within the party and could unite it behind his candidacy. And so maybe the DPP just got lucky and nominated a really great candidate, and that's a big part of the outcome here. Um, then there's often uh, some criticisms of the incumbent president, Lee Dung Hui, uh, and having kind of a behind-the-scenes role in making sure the strongest KMT candidate <coughs> did not get nominated, um, and uh, perhaps undermining the KMT from within. Um, and in fact, after the election, <coughs> Lee Dung Hui is kicked out of the party, founds his own party, Thailand, or the, the TSU, Taiwan Solidarity Union, and then um, turns out to team up with Chen Shui-bian, and uh, they, they are pretty close after the election, right? And so there, it looks like there might be some truth to this, but again, this is just, this requires this kind of long backstory about how Li dong Hui is, you know, calculating decades in advance that he's going to undermine this dominant party. Um, there may be a story about James Song that we can tell, too, that he is perhaps uh, exceptionally self-interested and narcissistic, <laughs> um, that he, uh, in fact, he has run in many elections after this with, you know, declining vote shares each time, um, and perhaps he just had little interest in uh, preserving the KMT and was only out looking out for himself. That actually sounds a lot like most politicians that I know, though, so I don't think James Song is that exceptional here. Um, and then finally, you sometimes hear a story about rising Taiwanese nationalism leading to a surge in support for the DPP and inconveniencing the KMT. And while I think there's something to this story, I don't think it's enough. Um, <coughs> what all of these factors point to, uh, in my mind, is the, the question, was the KMT just unlucky? Did all of these personality conflicts come out at the same time? Um, and so was this a very low probability event that happened uh, to produce a DPP victory in 2000? Um, the answer I'm going to give you today, just to preview, is a qualified yes. The KMT was unlucky in 2000, right? but there's a deeper institutional reason why, that, why being unlucky contributed to their defeat. Um, and that is that presidentialism, so I'm going to focus on the executive type, being a presidential system is bad for dominant parties like the KMT. Conversely, if you are a parliamentary system, uh, that's better for dominant party survival. Um, and if you'll forgive me, I'm going to draw on a sports metaphor to make this point. Um, so, uh, in America, college basketball championships are determined by the NCAA tournament. Right? You fill out a bracket. Are people familiar with this? Some. You fill out a bracket and there are different, par different um, teams seated and often you get upsets. So it's a series of single elimination contests and the higher seeds often beat the lower seeds. Uh, and, and so there's a great deal of unpredictability and um, so you can have an underdog team, like George Mason here, make a long run through the <coughs> tournament by uh, stringing together some improbable events. Right. What I'm going to suggest is that presidentialism is a lot like the NCAA tournament. These are high variance contests um, for executive control. The contrast is the NBA. Parliamentarism, I'm going to argue, is a lot more like mm. the NBA, mm. where Rather than a single elimination contest, you have seven game series. Um, so if you have Shaquille O'Neal in his prime, he's playing for the Lakers, They're, they have this huge advantage in the middle. Uh, over a seven game series, that advantage will assert itself. And it's really difficult then for an underdog to pull off the upset. You I'll might lose one. Lynn up there. Jeremy Lin, yeah. Um, I like this as example in part because the Sixers won the first game of the series. Huge upset. We'd probably still be talking about it. But then the Lakers won the next four games by double digits. Okay, so one game, anything can happen. Seven game series, the team with Shaquille O'Neal is probably going to win. All right. So presidentialism, one game series. Parliamentarism, if you have Shaquille O'Neal, you're in good shape. All right. So let me give you a picture of where we're headed for the rest of this talk. I'm going to talk uh, 
in a little more detail about why I think presidential contests are higher variance than parliamentary contests. Uh, I'm then going to turn to some of the comparative data that I've collected and show you that. I won't spend too much time on it, um, but we need that to kind of uh, to make the case here. And then I'm going to turn uh, in the conclusion to a reassessment of how we think of elections in Taiwan, and in particular, this partisan turnover in 2000. Preserve my voice here, just a moment. Just like Marco Rubio. Now. Yeah, I just I just pulled a Rubio, <laughs> um, and now it's preserved for posterity's sake. Okay, um, so let me turn to the theory now. So we're moving away from Taiwan to the more general theory of why presidential elections are going to be higher variance than parliamentary elections. Right. Um, and I'm going to give you three reasons. The first is that races are more personalized, uh, so personal candidate qualities matter more in the election outcome. Uh, second is that there are more institutional hurdles to party re-election in presidential regimes. And third, there's a winner-take-all executive in presidential regimes. There's one race, you win it, you win the whole prize. In a parliamentary regime, that not, that's not necessarily the case. So let me take you through each of these. Races are more personalized. Why do I say this? Well, uh, an underdog party, if they nominate a great candidate, can win uh, even if they're a big underdog. And we don't have to go too far to find examples of this. So in 1952, in the United States, um, Dwight D. Eisenhower is a popular war hero. In fact, both parties try to get him at the top of their ticket. The Republican Party succeeds. Eisenhower then wins this landslide victory in the 52 election. Note how personalized this campaign is. Back Ike. It's not vote for Eisenhower, it's Ike. I like Ike, in fact, is the slogan. Um, and so they're trying to personalize the race around the character and qualities of their candidate, rather than, note what's not here, any mention of his party. He, there's no mention he's a Republican, and in fact, in 1952, that probably would have been a, a disadvantage. It would have dragged the ticket down. Um, and so, uh, if you find an Eisenhower, if you find Ike, uh, you as an underdog party can still potentially pull off the upset. Conversely, then, if you don't nominate an Ike, you nominate a very lousy candidate, you can blow your whole advantage um, and end up being upset. So that's the first difference here. Um, second, there are institutional hurdles to re-election in presidential regimes that may not exist in parliamentary regimes. Um, for one, there are executive term limits in many presidential regimes. So if you have a popular incumbent, think Bill Clinton, 1992, 1996, wins re-election, 2000, term limited out of office. Uh, most Americans would have voted Bill Clinton in for a third term. He's term limited out, they run Al Gore instead, Gore is not as popular. Right. So term limits contributed then to democratic defeat in 2000. In parliamentary regimes, there are virtually no cases of a term limit on the number of terms a prime minister can serve. I, I've, <laughs> I've given this talk several times and I've heard of exactly one case where there's a constitutional limit on prime ministers. Where is that? Thailand, the most recent constitution. Interesting. Yeah, it was there's a backstory to this that I can tell you later. But, uh, <laughs> there is, uh, if you know anything about Japan, the LDP has a limit on the number of terms their president can serve. But that's a party limitation, not a constitutional limitation. <coughs> right. So term limits, common in presidential regimes, exceedingly rare in parliamentary ones. Second, presidential regimes almost always feature fixed terms in office. So you have four years or five years or six years. And then, no matter what's happening in the world or the economy, you are up for re-election. Um, in parliamentary regimes, by contrast, you can, and you often see leaders do this, try to time your re-election with upswings in popularity. Um, so, <coughs> um, if the economy is doing well, you may call a snap early election, win a, a larger majority, and then you can ride that out for four or five years. And so this ability to time your re-election should also increase your survival chances. Right. Uh, finally, there are succession fights in both types of regimes, but in presidential regimes, they are inevitably tied up with the coming election. 
And so if there's a battle between James Sol and Lian Jan, that's taking place right in the run-up to the election that may decide KMT control. Uh, in parliamentary regimes, by contrast, you can have this battle mid-term. You can have a couple years for things to kind of settle out. So a great example of this is from Britain. Um, in the late 80s, Margaret Thatcher was the prime minister of the Conservative Party, becoming increasingly unpopular. Her party basically overthrew her, defenestrated her, threw her out the window, and replaced her with John Major mid-term. John Major then had a couple of years to recover uh, and to raise the party's popularity, and when he led them into the next election, they won that election when they weren't forecast to a mere month prior. And so um, we got 18 consecutive years of conservative rule in Britain, in part because you could do this. You could throw Margaret Thatcher out the window. Right. Um, finally, let me emphasize that presidentialism features a single winner-take-all race. There are, unlike in parliamentarism, there are no kind of post-election coalitions that have to be built in order to seize control of the executive. Um, and you can win without a majority. So you can have plurality winners, like in Taiwan in 2000, uh, in presidential issues. Uh, this is not only a Taiwan phenomenon. In fact, the end of predominance in Mexico in 2000 occurred when Vincente Fox won only 42.5%. So this looks a lot like the Chen Shui-bian victory, right? You win with much less than a majority. If this were a parliamentary regime, he would have to find a coalition partner and it's likely that the other two parties would coalesce against him rather than with him. Same in Taiwan. <clears throat> so, this is what I call the Cinderella effect. I'm going to talk about how there's a higher variance that affects than expected duration of ruling parties in office. And I'm going to give you, I'll call it a baby model, okay? Some very simple assumptions in this idealized world, and I'll show you how the results differ across presidential and parliamentary regimes. So, in a presidential race, I'm going to assume we have a plurality rule winner, so you don't have to win everything, you just have to win one more vote than the other guy. You have one seat, the presidency, that you win for the executive. Uh, and let's assume there's a favored party. So the KMT, say, wins each race with probability 0.6, or 60% of the time. What's the probability, then, that they win re-election? Well, oops, go forward. Uh, it's the probability that they win the presidency. Uh, 0.6, or 60% of the time, you win re-election. In a parliamentary race, by contrast, let's assume the same thing, plurality rule, but a hundred identical seats rather than just one, and a favored party then same, has the same advantage, wins with 0.6 probability, or 60% of the time. The probability of retaining the executive then is that you win a majority of all of those hundred seats. That's 0.98. 98% of the time that happens versus 0.6, so already we have a big divergence in the predicted uh, re-election probabilities of a ruling party. Oops. That's not all. What we really care about is this effect over several election cycles. And so, in a presidential race, probability 0.6 times five election cycles is just 0.6 to the fifth. Po 0.08, or 8% of the time, a ruling party with this kind of advantage lasts five election cycles in power. In a parliamentary race, 0.98 to the fifth is 92% of the time. So we have this huge divergence in our predicted survival here. Only 8% of the time in president, 92% of the time in parliament. Right. So the empirical expectations that this exercise should leave you with, um, for one, over the long term, at least, we should expect ruling parties in presidential regimes to face higher hazard rates, so they should face a higher likelihood of losing power at any given moment uh, than in parliamentary regimes, all else equal. Uh, and more critically, that there's a conditional effect. So what this means is that the more advantaged you are, if you are the KMT and you are particularly dominant, really dominant, uh, you, you should fare much, much worse in a presidential regime than in a parliamentary regime. Uh, if you're an average party, the difference shouldn't be quite as great. So we expect to see a kind of 